Okay, hey everyone. Yeah, so this is awkward for me too, showing my face on the internet. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I hate the fact that, you know, relentless comments on women's appearance and the threat of, you know, ducksing and stalking, as I know some women, especially feminists, experience. I didn't want that to keep me um, from, yeah, being visible in the public sphere and being part of the conversation, because of course I know showing my face is going to get more people to watch this channel, or, well, we'll see if the the pearls outweigh the cons. Just a quick note here, um, the, the reason I'm showing my face is because I think this issue is so important, and I think I can get more people to pay attention if they can see a person. Here. I am. This is me. I am Ellie Arrow. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about me. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about, well, surprise, surprise, prostitution. That's what this channel is about. Uh, today's video is going to be a response video to a news clip, uh, a brief interview uh, with someone making the case for a fully decriminalized sex trade or legalized, decriminalizing the person who sells, the, per uh, the person who buys, and the person who profits from that transaction which is a brothel owner, an escort agency owner. That's the very basic shape of that model. And uh, this is taken from GB News, Great Britain News, which is, I guess, a conservative uh, news channel that also, in a later segment on the same evening show, interviewed me. As you know, there isn't time to cover every issue, and there were a lot of things said in this particular clip, this video, that I want to respond to. So it's not about this particular woman. I don't want, you know, trashing of her in particular. I think she's going on this TV show because she genuinely cares about women in prostitution, and she's been told the best way to protect them is, you know, to fully decriminalize the industry. I think she's wrong, but she's not having any kind of ill intent. Like, I will, I promise you, I will do response videos to literal pimps on German TV who get invited to our talk shows all the time. I will talk about that and I respond to that. When that happens, uh, you are 100% free to trash those people because they're uh, arguing, you know, for their profit margin. But I believe this woman is generally just arguing um, her case um, because she cares about women too. Uh, and she's just got a different set of ideas from what I do, and I want to engage with the ideas. So that's what I'm going to do. I, I'm not going to give you a background like, who is this lady? Uh, she, from what I know, it's she's an actress, and um, she does projects, I guess, that uh, also deal with prostitution. That's how she came in touch with this subject. And her um, line of thinking is, you know, sex work is work, and that's the position. Okay, we're going to talk about that. All right, let's do this. Part of me thinks, well, if a woman wants to do that, if they want to be part of a consensual transaction, then all power to her. Well, better that than thinking, oh, she's a dirty criminal. So, you know, we don't want to be up in other people's business. We don't want to tell women what to do. And that is, a, I think that is actually a healthy intuition. Certainly better than judging women. It's just, it's not the whole story. It's not just about individuals. It's like, what is the system these women are in? How does it work? Who are the other players? Like, why are we always asking, is it okay for women to sell? And we never ask, is it okay for men to buy? There are startlingly worrying figures about all the other nefarious activities relating to prostitution. Is decriminalizing it on behalf of the prostitutes the best way forward, or should it be fully decriminalized or fully criminalized? Where would you stand? Um, I mean, I've discussed it. Um, I've discussed it on my podcast, Say Your Mind. I've discussed the fact that um, it's important for us to listen to sex workers. I think that the main issue that we have in Britain is that sex workers weren't actually consulted about whether it should be criminalized or decriminalized. I'm also going to point out the stuff where I agree, yeah. So women in the sex trade should be consulted for legislation, both for the New Zealand model, which is what she's going to advocate. Uh, women in the sex trade were consulted, and the same is true for Sweden. Sweden did a many hundreds of pages report. More than 100 of those pages were interviews with women in the sex trade. These two countries, which are pitted against each other as, you know, model models, both of them listened to sex workers, listened to women in prostitution, and they came to wildly different conclusions. This woman, Kalichi Okafor, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and, and me, we both listened to women in prostitution and we came to wildly different conclusions. That's the reality. You cannot listen to this gigantic group of people and just come out with one opinion. You're going to find 
Just like any large group of people, they wildly disagree with each other. But then at the end of the day, you have to make a choice. Is prostitution work or is it exploitation? You can't have both. You're going to have to prioritize one over the other. We're having conversations around sex workers. I mean, I'm here today also talking about sex workers, but I work with sex workers and being that almost palatable voice to speak mm. on their behalf. But I would prefer if they were able to speak for themselves. But why are they not able to speak for themselves? Because we exist in a society that has already shamed um, women when it comes to the notion of sex. Yeah, it is true. It is hard for women who are in the sex trade or have experience in the sex trade to speak publicly because of the gigantic fucking stigma that exists in every single country for fear of, yeah, public shaming, being ostracized by their family members, uh, by their partners, by their friends, being harassed. Yeah, I know women who do this work and like, they have stalkers. All, all these uh, usually men do is be like, where is she going to speak next? What's her real name? Where does she live? It's fucking terrifying. And I'm sure this does also happen to the other side. So. I would just encourage, I guess, both sides to lay off women with sex trade experience. Uh, we should try and make it less difficult for them to speak, even if we don't like what they're saying. We would have more voices if there was less stigma. The question is, how do we decrease the stigma? Because I come from a country where prostitution is legal, um, though there are ifs and buts in there, as there are in New Zealand too. And it's still really hard for women to speak. There is still a stigma. There's still the idea, you know, women who sell sex, they are sexually deviant. They are nymphomaniacs. They may choose to do it, but that isn't interpreted as a good thing or an expression of agency or anything like that. A lot of people think these women are lazy. They don't want to get a real job. This is why they do it. Or they're, yeah, sexual deviants and they just want to have sex all the time and they're basically unrapeable. That idea is still very, very strong in Germany. I would still wager, and you can challenge me on this, that it is harder to come out publicly and say, look, prostitution was rape for me than it is to come out and say prostitution was work. Because you're making yourself even more vulnerable if you're talking about a personal trauma. A lot of the women I know, even those who have sometimes years in public speaking, they say they get panic attacks all the time before speaking publicly. This is another reason why women like me or women like Kalichi Okafor on the other side speak out because we don't have that personal PTSD or whatever it is attached to the issue. It's easier for us. This is not because we want to drown out other voices. I always recommend people, obviously, to go and listen to the women with the personal experience. But if only those women talk, the most vulnerable, the most traumatized are the least likely to be part of the conversation. And this doesn't mean I think like I'm a voice for the mega oppressed. I'm just saying that is true, regardless of what you think the best solution is. You know, having, having allies speak on this issue is one part having more trauma-informed um, events, but I mean, is it ever going to be e easy to get up on a stage and talk about your experience of being raped? I mean, one thing that helps is, I guess, not treating, not asking every woman to always recount her most traumatic experiences, but instead asking questions like, so what do you think we should do to make things better? And then again, other women are like, I don't want to speak about policy. I want to speak about my experience. That's where I feel my expertise is. So treating women as individuals helps, uh, platforming them helps, but uh, we can't snap our fingers and make this conversation easy. It's always going to be hard exist in a society that has already shamed um, women when it comes to the notion of sex. It's true. Uh, the, one of the biggest reasons that women in prostitution are stigmatized is because the idea is they're having too much sex and they're having sex in a way that isn't, well that's the thing, officially it's not approved. Behind closed doors, uh, of course, the patriarchy has always wanted women to be, you know, wildly sexually available. Ideally, you know, in a manner that is submissive and focused on male pleasure. And uh, women also get shamed for not being sexually available. I think that's often forgotten. Like, women and girls who don't want to have sex or not the type of sex that men want to have or that don't want to date men uh, are horribly shamed also. So, um... You know, in patriarchy, you can't when you're either having too much sex or too little. And the woman in prostitution is the embodiment of the woman who has too much sex. And the idea is that every man that she's with, you know, her value decreases and decreases and decreases. That's the idea. I guess I'm not telling you very new information. I'm just saying I, I agree with her. I just don't think the solution is therefore celebrate, you know, every situation where a woman has a lot of sex because we still have to ask about the conditions 
How is that sex happening? Who's actually profiting from that? Who's really making money? Because it's usually not the woman herself. Who's really getting pleasure? And it's not her either. Uh, and not just not pleasure. For a lot of women, prostitution is traumatizing. If women have been shamed for something, the idea is then not to go celebrate it, but to ask, you know, how does it actually benefit women? Yeah, and that's kind of why I feel like the other side is not asking. They just jump from, instead of demeaning her, we're going to celebrate it. We can celebrate her as a person without celebrating the conditions she's surviving under. Everything exists on the spectrum. So we are looking specifically at decriminalizing or not sex work, but that still exists on, a set, um, on the spectrum of a woman who may be in a relationship with a man who would then um, take her images and want to put it online or use that in a way to kind of um, whether blackmail or to just do things. But we wouldn't be able to do that in a society where women were able to participate equally in sex and to be seen as equal members. She, is she saying women who are in relationships and take nude photos for their partners and then put them online shouldn't be shamed? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, they shouldn't be shamed. We still have to ask ourselves, how does the woman benefit from putting those images online? Because she doesn't. I mean, like, like Kalichi Okafor said, then she mentioned revenge porn. I'm confused, like, what's that got to do with prostitution? The term sex work is not helpful, one, because it's harm denying. A lot of women with sex trade experience would not like that term to be used, for them at least. And you don't know what the fuck it means anymore. Is it a woman selling pictures of her breasts online? And I'm not saying that's harmless, it really isn't, as any, you know, victim of revenge pornography knows, it's not harmless. But is it the same thing as being in a brothel? No, of course not. But I agree with her that women should not be shamed whether those photos were put online intentionally or unintentionally. But still at the end of the day, before we celebrate it, ask yourself, who benefits when, you know, pictures of a naked woman's body are online? Is, is she having better orgasms because those pictures are online? Or is it, are, you know, strange men jerking off to it? And she's now a threat of, I don't know, being recognized on the street, worst case scenario. But sex in our society is about power. Agreed. And so when we are talking about decriminalization, what are we talking about? If we're talking about power, we should surely give power to the people who want to engage in this way. If I could snap my fingers and neatly separate the sex trade into, you know, these people choose it, these don't, and then people who don't want it can get out, and the people who do want it can get, you know, happy, great, safe conditions, I would. In my opinion, with all the evidence I've seen, it's not possible. Like I said, you have to prioritize either the people who don't want to be in there or the people who do want to be in there. In my opinion, the sex trade legislation, because all the demographic data would indicate that the majority do not choose to be there, not by any meaningful measure of sexual consent. So therefore, your legislation is not about giving power to people who enjoy prostitution, but people who want to get the fuck out because it's destroying their lives. That has to be your priority, in my opinion. That doesn't mean screw those other people, but by definition, if they're choosing it, they have alternatives. So if, uh, you know, the number of uh, buyers decreases, they have other places to go. So I would wager generally in society, ideally, you try to write legislation on the basis of who's the most vulnerable. It would help us to not convolute and conflate sex trafficking with sex work. Yeah, that's the cardinal sin, conflating those two. And just to be very clear, me and most other women working on this issue and men are we're not saying prostitution and trafficking are the same we're saying they are inextricably connected you cannot have one without the other one the destination for sex trafficking is prostitution the destination for sex trafficking is the street area the brothel the escort agency that includes a lot of legal areas and places and we have an unfortunately very long list of such cases happening in Germany, being discovered. We don't know how many went undiscovered. And on this, I like to quote uh, Jürgen Rudloff, who is a famous, uh, infamous mega pimp in Germany who ran the Paradise brothel chain, who said, you cannot run a brothel without trafficking, without the help of organized crime, because you're always lacking volunteers. There aren't even enough women driven by poverty. You have to use violence. You cannot have a sex trade of the kind of size that you get when it's legal, like in Germany, without violent coercion. That's one reason why you can't separate them. When you write legislation on one, it always affects the other. Women also go back and forth, like they're women who enter prostitution with a pimp, they get rid of the pimp, but are they really in there by choice? Women who enter as minors, and then they're adults, are they, is it suddenly fine and consensual because they're now adults when they entered at 16? What about women who get in by choice, but then later end up being uh, indebted to the brothel owner. That is also a form of pimping. So women 
transition from trafficking to prostitution back and forth all the time. The boundaries between these two concepts is incredibly blurry, as well as the fact that in my opinion, economic coercion, you know, to, to have someone have sex with you because they need money is violence. And we recognize that when the landlord asks for sex. A sex buyer who asks a poor woman for sex is exactly the same thing. <clears throat> How on earth, and unless this industry is in some way regulated or, or, you know, actually talked about and pulled out of stigma, how on earth can we go about the very difficult business of being able to find out the women who are there consensually, who are happy to be there doing that work, and the women who really are not, and, and perhaps they're, they've been trafficked or perhaps they're just extremely vulnerable? I mean, that is the perfect question to ask someone who uh, supports a fully decriminalized sex trade. How are you going to identify who wants to be there and who doesn't? And what counts as vulnerable enough? In a legal sex trade, this is what I talk about in my segment, if you're a victim of poverty or violence or whatever, you are having to go through, it's hard enough in, under any legislation to prove that you're a victim, but it's going to be extra hard because the assumption is unless you're crying for help, unless you have tons of proof and eyewitnesses and unless you can prove that the bruises on your arm, which could come from consensual BDSM, you know, are actually from your trafficker or from a sex buyer, then you're not going to get any kind of justice. I understand that women in the sex trade, historically and still today, are let down so horribly and horrifically by various institutions and authorities and the police that they don't trust a, a legislation that's going to say, oh, we're going to turn that around and they're actually going to start taking care of you. I understand why there's mistrust there and they therefore rather support the New Zealand model, which is really a model of we're just kind of hoping that this industry will self-regulate. So there's, I mean, there's some regulations in the law, but they're unenforceable. So, I mean, you can't even keep kids out of brothels reliably. But it's essentially asking you, you know, if you got a problem, you got to report that. I hope you're taken seriously because <laughs> that's the thing. Even under the New Zealand model, you have to work with authorities. You have to work with police because the moment that she does have a problem with the brothel owner, the buyer, policeman harassing her, whoever, she does need to go to authorities. It always comes back to authorities. You can't work without them. I wish I could snap my fingers and we can, you know, because same domestic violence and rape institutions that women down all the time. I wish we could have a way to not work with institutions, but in this society that we're in right now, these are our only tools, and it does not matter which legislation you support. It goes for the Swedish model and the New Zealand model. Both of them ask institutions to reform and support women better, just with a different attitude, the fundamental attitude of, oh, she's a worker. Oh, she's an exploited person. I look at the New Zealand model, because most times we cite the Nordic model, but I look at the New Zealand model. So let's model. talk about the Nordic model is decriminalising the sex worker. Yes, but, but criminalising. the client. Yes, yet. but not the client. And the New Zealand model is? And just decriminalising it. And I think they've had that since around 2003. And they've mm. seen a um, reduction in harm against um, sex workers. And I think that that's the most important thing. I'm actually not going to make the case that uh, the New Zealand model had no positive effects at all. So what was the reality in New Zealand beforehand? It's just like Germany. New Zealand did kind of tolerate the sex trade. Male elites throughout history have always been able to buy women if they want to. And many of them were also like, yeah, our workers and our soldiers also need to be pacified. How do we do that? You know, prostitution is one method. Prostitution, of course, existed in New Zealand post-colonization. Not so much prior, as far as I'm aware, that was not an indigenous practice. But, you know, just because a thing is or isn't an indigenous practice in one place does not mean that we can always draw universal conclusions from that. I'm just saying in that case, prostitution New Zealand is largely a product of colonization. It was always available to lead men. In the form of massage parlors, which is still like a very popular shape that prostitution comes in, in Australia and New Zealand, a lot of them were tolerated. But at the end of the day, of course, women could still be arrested. It kind of depended on what the local authorities wanted to and wanted not to do. It is the good thing that this law said, no, these women are not criminals. These women are vulnerable. And there was a study done before. And like I said, they did talk to women in sex trade. They found out, you know, most of the women are in there due to poverty. Where are we punishing women for poverty? That's dumb. Let's stop doing that. So you do see positive effects from this legislation where women feel like, okay, no, like we feel secure that we're not, not going to be arrested. The reality is they do still get arrested, just like Germany, if they're breaking zoning legislation, if they're violating migration, that's especially tough in New Zealand. You can get stopped at the airport if you're suspected of prostitution. You can get kicked out of the country if you're an illegal migrant. If you are a victim of trafficking and you're, for example, made to do low-level crime like some drug dealing, you know, you'll be treated as a criminal. 
and not recognized as a victim. So there's still ways women are criminalized, but I would assume arrests of women went down and that is a good thing. And the positive effects you find in the legislation, in my opinion, from what I read from the report, can vast majority of it be traced back to that decriminalizing the seller. There is somewhat more trust in authorities, although you'll find very important passages where you see, you know, violence against women does absolutely continue from buyers and um, from brothel owners. Although women say they feel safer, like this, feel like they could report, the reality is the vast majority still do not. The vast majority of their abuse by the brothel owner just moved to a different brothel. The vast majority who are attacked by sex bias also still do not report. Like there's feeling safe and then there's actually being able to access mechanisms of relative safety, you know, holding a, a perpetrator to account. And in practice, they're still not really accessible. And I think that review was done in 2008 and there hasn't really been one since. They just concluded, you know, we have beneficial effects, so this legislation is good. And now that it's really only debate about zoning, and a debate about um, migrants. Should they decriminalize migrants selling sex in New Zealand? And um, in my opinion, they should, but don't decriminalize their exploiters because the reason why New Zealand kept it illegal is they realized, yeah, it, they would essentially decriminalize um, cross-border human trafficking. There's also trafficking people inside a country, but there's a topic for another day. That's why they have decided not to do that yet. You're also not allowed to open a brothel if you're not a citizen of the country which I think is, you know, keeps a slight lid on it. But at the end of the day, mostly it's still women being arrested and that's not a way to combat trafficking. That's, um, that's cruel. And this is where both sides would agree. We just, again, disagree about the solution. Yes, you can find ways that it has benefited women, but it is still so far from good enough. And you will find an increasing number of survivors from New Zealand telling you, look, this is ways in which it's gotten worse vastly disproportionate exploitation of indigenous women, vastly disproportionate exploitation of migrant women, even though that's entirely illegal. There's a huge number of Asian women and the same as Germany, you see a decrease in prices. There is a report by the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women that outlines exactly how the developments in New Zealand after the 2003 law are essentially the same as the 2002 German law, even though we pretend by calling one decriminalization and the other legalization that they are very different. That was a very long answer to her saying one sentence. <laughs> the more that we push sex workers into the shadows, the more dangerous it actually becomes for them. And if we say that we're going to criminalize the people who purchase sex or, you know, purchase any sort of service within that realm, then what that does is it makes it a buyer's market and it makes it even harder for these people to make a living and it makes it very dangerous for them as well because they can't really pick and choose who they actually want to engage with. And I mean, like I already said, the reality is you see a fall in prices when you legalize the sex trade because competition increases. Everyone gets to get a piece of the pie and by everyone, I mean mostly pimps. It becomes so lucrative to traffic in women from abroad and to exploit local women that actually women are earning less, not more. And that also means they have less choice. And most women's sex trade don't even have choice of a customer. It's only like the top 10 or 5% do. Like I already outlined, if you can't even have legal mega brothels like in Germany with hundreds of rooms and hundreds of people in the building, you cannot keep exploited children out, you cannot keep gangs out, you cannot keep drugs out, you cannot keep murder out, then what the fuck are you talking about when you say women in the shadows, it's bad. It's bad when it's in the light. This industry is always partially in the shadow because, like I said, it cannot function without exploitation. That's why it has to be in the twilight. Always. It has to be accessible to the buyers. They need to be able to find it. But it has to be in the dark enough that it's, you know, we can't always waltz in and get the kids out, get the trafficked women out, get the dr drug addicted women out. That's the nature of the industry. No legislation will change that. No legislation can make prostitution truly safe. And the safety mechanisms I just going to talk about, like I said, are not accessible to most women, no matter what your law is. And so they're having to maybe engage with more people or different types of people that they wouldn't usually um, take on as clients. Literally, if you read reports by sex trade survivors in New Zealand, they said after the law, after the 2003 law, sex buyers became more demanding. They asked, um, they were more demanding about you not using condoms, even though that was a mandate in, in New Zealand. It wasn't in Germany, by the way. They became more brazen. They became more entitled. They became more violent. The market became more competitive. Things got worse. Uh, a lot of women 
that I've spoken to who have experienced New Zealand sex trade say it's like the Wild West. Okay, so you're less likely to be arrested, but women in the sex trade don't just have the police's adversary, as real as that is. There are all these other violent strangers, sex bias, criminal gangs, pimps, getting into conflicts with residents, and all those problems continue, and some of them get worse. What can we do to make sure that we're hearing the voices of the people that want to share their experiences, whether they might be terrible or whether they actually they like being there? The only way we can do that is specifically as women. I don't really focus on men in this situation. Specifically as women, we have to get past our false dichotomy when it comes to the virgin whore complex that, oh, you, if you do this, if you engage and you participate in this way, it's dirty, it's shameful in some way, because then we can look across at other women having different experiences and hold space for them okay I guess she kind of has a point yeah there's women who participate in stigma women you know participate in slut uh, I don't like the term slut shaming but calling women sluts there there are no sluts in my opinion yeah sure like women participate in this the in my opinion biggest purveyors of stigma if stigma is you know distaste distrust anger dehumanization against people in sex trade there's sex buyers Sex buyers are about a fifth of the male population. A lot of them are quite powerful. They can be a politician. They can be, you know, researchers. They can be journalists. These men have power in society. Way more than any radical feminist you're going to meet. These men are part of the establishment of those in power. How do I know that a lot of them hate women in the sex trade? By the way they talk and by the way they treat them. By the fact that this is the most murder group of women on the planet. And most of them are killed by sex bias. Yes, it's important to talk about how women fight against each other and undermine each other. But you didn't even mention once the men who are doing the murdering and the raping of women in sex trade. Why are they not in this conversation? Okay, this video is not done. <laughs> I've been talking for so long, it's gotten dark outside. So I have to turn on the lights and get this, you know, great lighting going here. Is there not a risk, though, that via, via fully decriminalizing sex work, in order to protect those people involved in that industry, that there's a risk of potentially normalizing the concept of a woman's body being for sale? That is exactly what happens. When you normalize the sex trade, you normalize a certain type of, well, the sex buyer's gaze. Every woman who walks down the street could have a potential price tag. How much for her? How much do I need to get into that. That is certainly a mentality that a lot of sex buyers acquire that gets strengthened in society. So you have more harassment. For example, this is a worldwide plague, but it becomes even more pronounced. You have landlords harassing tenants for sex, because why not? It's just an exchange of a service for something of monetary value like rent. Women in service jobs get chronically harassed, horrifically harassed. You know, waitresses, these kind of jobs, because the assumption is, yeah, for a little extra, you know, I'll just ask her to come to my hotel. A lot of the, you know, women I know who are students and then do part-time jobs say, this happens all the time. And it wouldn't be, and it's legal, right? So she can't say, oh, I'm, I'm being harassed here. It, it's a job offer. Uh, this gets worse. Then obviously in the situation in legal sex trade areas, which are obviously the poor part of town because no one wants a brothel next door, so it's pushed on poor people. And then poor women and girls who live in these areas have to live with chronic harassment from street uh, crawlers, uh, sex buyers, and pimps. And yeah, growing up being like, well, you know, if my life goes to shit, then I'll be standing there or I'll in the window or on the street or wherever. Things are especially bad also for migrant women in Germany, and this will go for Great Britain too, Eastern European women. So there are men who say that they can't even hear the Eastern European accent without, you know, getting sexually interested because the assumption is, you know, they hear that accent in the prostitution context, so their instant association with an Eastern European woman is, you know, what's her price tag? How can be that Eastern European women or other minorities, for example, trans women, how can they possibly have equality in society when there is a significant number of men walking around just wondering about their price tags, wondering what can this person do for me sexually? Instead of seeing a human being, what at best service, at worst, you know, brutal sexual, sexual submission can that person do for me? I think that's really, really interesting because is it only in sex work that a woman's body is for sale? 
Literally everywhere a woman's body is for sale. People are chosen to be, you know, the poster people for various organizations because subliminally we are selling sex all of the time. We're selling women's bodies all of the time. The issue here is the woman having the autonomy to describe and to dictate um, the, you know, confines within which that transaction is going to be made. Just because it happens everywhere doesn't mean you can't point to where it's particularly bad. Okay, so there's racism everywhere. But why can't I talk about if it's particularly bad in one area or in one city or in one time period? Women's bodies are objectified everywhere, but no, advertising is not the same as prostitution. It is true that there's an overlap between the modeling industry and the sex trade, but she's not even going there with her analysis. Her analysis is just like, society's already doing it all the time, so why not take this version of it? It's bad logic. Women's bodies are objectified in many places. We need to end all of it. And just because that happens doesn't mean you can't say that the prostitution is particularly bad because, you know, whether you're in retail or you're a waitress or you're on a desk job or you're an engineer or you're a teacher or you're a doctor, you do not have men writing reviews about your breast size, your butt size, how tight your vagina was, how tight your anus was. Uh, rating you on the basis of your skin color and uh, your age, uh, your fuckability. And if they did, that would be considered harassment. But they're certainly not rating the inside of your body because only in prostitution do they get to access that. And that's not to shame women, it's to explain the level of vulnerability and dehumanization that goes on. I uh, I might make a video where I just list this off, the, the, um, the health risks associated with prostitution, because there are some of there in that list that don't exist for literally any other job. Y yes, we are objectifying women in many, many places. No, we're not selling women's bodies everywhere. If you still feel inclined to make that comparison again, I'll, I'll make a video about the health risks and I point you to, I'll put a link down below, the reviews that men write and just read what they say about women and what they do to women and if you really think that's just like your job in which case i think you have a right to go to hr asip go to a human rights tribunal really if your job is just like prostitution i would go as far as to say marriage traditionally is the selling of a woman's body really but people have reclaimed that they found romance in that okay yeah this is a tricky one huh yeah marriage historically has a lot in common with prostitution one, because literally families were selling women to uh, another tribe, another group, a more powerful man. They might rise in status if their, woman, their daughter or sister is married to the right duke. Yeah, no, it's true. But just pointing at, you know, we have problems over here and we have problems over here. Like, it's a whataboutism. It is. As feminists, of course, like, we critique marriage. Do I think marriage can be reclaimed? That's maybe a longer debate for another day. I think it is natural and normal that most people want to live in some form of partnership that that partnership might take certain formalities in a society i don't think is necessarily inherently bad it matters what is at the core of that is it about two people loving and taking care of each other or is it about wanting to possess another person so i don't agree with her necessarily though that uh well romans Many feminists have done great critiques of romance, that romance is another way to make traditional confining or dangerous roles amicable to women. Yeah, and a lot of us feminists, we quite happily abolish marriage, at least the form that, you know, uh, for example, makes a lot of women financially dependent on their husband. That's a huge issue. That's how, you know, women, uh, a lot of women end up in in prostitution um, because uh, they're of the, the financial deaths of their husband. These things also go hand in hand, unfortunately. Um, do I think prostitution marriage are the same? No, they're not exactly the same. They have historic similarities. They still have overlaps and problematic aspects uh, that they both have today. But we're increasingly saying women need to have their own financial independence, uh, their own support system, so that if things go bad, they can leave and they have a community to back them. That's, I guess, my very short summary of what I support. I'm not a separatist and I don't think separatism is viable for most women. But if someone would want to do that, you know, all the power to you. But again, don't think prostitution can be reclaimed because in a partnership, in a relationship, I can see what a woman gets from that. I can see how it benefits her too. In an ideal situation where people are respectful and loving, there is obvious benefit to the woman. There isn't in prostitution. Literally, only benefit to women in prostitution is she has money. And 
in, I hope in a functioning fair society, we can have ways that women can have resources and housing and what they need and nice things without having to resort to that. So yeah, but okay, we can debate this uh, some more if you guys want another time or in the comments. Why can't we start looking at ways, the nuances when we talk about women and power and bodies and sex specifically, what are we saying? And, and when it comes to sex workers that um, you've had the opportunity to speak to and talk to, are they uh, sort of held together, psychologically secure people who have chosen to do this? Or have they got pretty dark backstories that have led, to this, led them to this particular industry and they're struggling with it and want to leave? I think that it can be a combination of both. I guess I agree with uh, Kalichi Okafi who you can't neatly separate. Like, here are the women who are doing great and here are the women who are doing badly. I have yet to meet a woman in prostitution who hasn't had a bad experience. And when I say bad, I mean rape. And uh, most of us don't experience that at our work. But it's not a value judgment, it's just saying prostitution carries exceptional risks. I don't want to talk about the women so much, I want to talk about the sex buyer. When the sex buyer goes to the brothel or the escort service, whatever, and he decides, today, you know, I fucking hate women, I want to show women their place. When he does that, do you think he's going to have an in-depth interview with the woman about her conditions and her history and her attitudes towards prostitution first before he strangles her? No, he's not. And this is why women who make more money or might have come from a middle class background or might, you know, not have had abuse in their childhoods, those things don't protect you from that kind of man. And that's why sex buying is problematic, independent of whether you can find uh, however many women who do like doing prostitution in whatever capacity. I've recently, as an actor, been working with an incredible writer who um, was, was a sex worker. I don't know if they're still um, working in that um, field, but reading their stories and wanting to um, bring that forward for them, there was a culmination of different um, themes that take place. But even in my human experience, I've also had dark experiences. So, and you know, experiences that would have affected my mental state. Basically what I'm saying is that our human experiences are just on a spectrum, they're vast. And we can't say people engage in this or decide to work in this field because of deep psychological issues, because really who doesn't have them? Oh, wow, that's, some, I'm sorry, but that is such whataboutism. Can you imagine if I said, you know, some of you guys know I've been a victim of stalking. If I said, you know, when women come out and they're worried about their anonymity in regards to prostitution, of having been in prostitution, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, because all of us have been stalked. Okay, yeah, women outside the sex trade get raped. Therefore, we can't call out that a, we know statistically a disproportionate number of women in the sex trade have been raped. And a lot of them, it started as children, about a third entered the sex trade as children. Another large number weren't in the sex trade per se, but they were abused. It is not a stereotype. It is a statistical truth. It is a concerning truth. We have to think about why that is such a big factor, not just poverty, but yeah, trauma. And it is, again, not to dehumanize women or say they're dumb or they can't ever make any decisions for themselves. It's to say, what in your life have you learned is the norm of how it's acceptable to talk to you, touch you, treat you? What? Where does violence start for you? Uh, and is that the same as the law or is it the same as other people? Because no, we do not all have the same, like she's saying we all have different experiences, but then she's really saying we're all having the same one, so therefore don't call out one as particularly bad. She's completely self-contradicting here. The reality is the average woman in prostitution has had a way, had a life that is far harder and more violent than women like me. I know what she's trying to do. I know she's trying to say we're all just people. You know, we all just need to see each other as equals. I can see you as an equal while acknowledging that we have different experiences. We ha are affected by different factors and systems of oppression. And I don't need to equate my experience with yours to respect you or see you as a three-dimensional human being. And imagine if we talked about violence against women in war zones and someone said along but did you know there's a lot of violence against women in peace times i'm sorry how is this not whataboutism in terms of you know if you were to decriminalize what you but if this country <laughs> were to decriminalize <laughs> prostitution do you think the model should be something a bit like amsterdam where you know you end up with red light districts and, and windows where women are able to advertise their wares so to speak or is that sort of taking the concept too far what would be a sort of good 
model? Is it brothels? Is it red light districts? Or is it actually just decriminalizing it and letting women choose how they go about soliciting? That is, again, assuming that women shape how the industry functions. They don't. Economic factors, migration factors, the climate, infrastructure, laws, authorities, pimps and sex buyers decide where prostitution takes place. The demand and the people with the actual power, the people who own the brothels and the escort agencies, which are rarely the women themselves, and even if they are, that doesn't mean you don't face violence, they decide where it happens. In what other industry are we saying, you know, the workers decide where to work? No, they have to go where the jobs are. They have to go where the demand is for their product or their service. Yeah, I think the healthiest thing that you or I could do in this situation is say that we don't know. We have to see. But from what I've been told, the New Zealand model is really what a lot of sex workers would prefer. The street statistically is um, more unsafe because the prices are low, the disrespect is high, the ability for the buyer to drive you in his car to very, you know, foreign location is, you know, he's got a lot of power there. But brothels is still very dangerous. Escorting is dangerous. You're going to a place you've never been. Uh, where who knows however men, many men might be waiting there for you you don't know your escape route so escorting is often seems quite safe and it's not it's quite dangerous actually it's not necessarily even expensive yeah no we haven't figured out a, a really safe place because they're all they're all dangerous all i can say is that yeah indoors seems to be from what i'm seeing slightly better than street but then maybe you know we got more statistics on the street because that's more visible so it's hard to say and the fact that we don't even have clear statistics from countries where prostitution is legal shows you again that trying to pull it out from under the shadows, out of the twilight, is not possible. Because that's how the industry works. It evades control, it evades even statistical evaluation. Because from what I've heard about um, how it sort of operates in Amsterdam, the power still ultimately remains with men and they can have like super clubs and they can have all of these things where yeah. sex workers aren't really being paid very well. So it might look all glitzy either. and glamoury, but they're not getting much in, in that. And in undocumented people also can't still participate in a safe way in that industry. Kalechi, thank you so much for coming. It's been utterly fascinating talking to you. Delights to have you here. Okay, we're at the end of the video and you can see I'm not very good with tech. Uh, hopefully in due time I'll figure that stuff out and do a slightly better job than this. But yeah, let me know what you think. I think we hear those arguments all the time. The most upsetting for me is always, oh, but we have objectification of women in other areas, therefore nothing special about prostitution. We have violence against women in other areas, therefore nothing special about prostitution. Those I find borderline offensive, I have to say. But yeah, I guess you can ask yourself, like, why, why is it still so popular? I guess it works in a lot of people's minds. It's... Uh, yeah, we don't want to think about prostitution because thinking that there is a system that is so violent and so awful, it can't be reformed. I mean, I would sleep easier if I was on the other side, for sure. I would be. If I thought that prostitution makes a lot of women, you know, safe, happy, financially stable, I would sleep better. But I just can't believe it from the evidence that I've seen. I, I can't. Um, yeah, what do you think? from this video. Do you encounter these arguments? What do you say when that happens? Does anything I say help you with that? Does it make it more confused? Am I making sense? Do you think Kalichi's making sense uh, and I missed something? Let me know. And if you have videos that you'd like me to respond to, uh, post them in the comments and I'll see if I have time to, to do them. Uh, especially if you got sex bias or pimps because I don't want to make this a channel where I just attack other women. I think Attacking women's ideas is fine, but uh, um, again, I want to make visible those actors who like to stay invisible, who would really like it if you know me and women on the other side. We're at each, at each other's throats and we're all calling each other, you know, fake feminists and, you know, you're responsible for violence against women's sex, sex trade. No, you're responsible. They would like us to do that. Uh, that's not what I want to do. These more invisible actors who hold a lot of power. Like I said, the sex bias who hold a lot of power in society. They're the problem. They're who I want to talk about. They're who I want to challenge. So if you got some videos of that kind for me, especially, please drop them down below. See ya.